has Paul Miller's Giratina V-Star deck, which is one of the decks that definitely can go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Charizard. Yeah, I think arguably Giratina V-Star is one of the most equipped decks to handle Charizard, so we'll have to see how this matchup goes. Some interesting things at play here. Ian Robb is the defending Indianapolis regional champion. He won the last time we were in Indy back in 2022, so he's looking to reclaim that title, you know, and also add a sixth regional championship victory to his resume. Paul Miller on the other side of the table, a bit of a hometown hero. hero I heard he's from Anderson, Indiana, just a little bit outside the city he's here at his local regional championships looking to make it into top eights yeah the hometown hero as you mentioned chip poised yeah with the deck that if you're choosing to play Giratina, you want to go up against Charizard, right? So off to a decent start. Prime Catcher falling into the prize cards. At least it's at the bottom and over on Ian's side. Nothing too impactful, I want to say. Yeah, that Cleffa, I guess, could be problematic depending on what Ian's opening hand looks like. If he's only got Poppins, no Nestfall to go get that Rotom B in play. Maybe could stunt his setup in the early game. Potentially that collapsed not being available could be something Ian would like to use to remove a liability from play. We'll see how it all plays out. Now taking a look at both of these players' lists, there are some interesting things to highlight. The ace pick of choice for Ian, which has been uh, a subject of a lot of debate, right, for Charizard, it is the maximum belt. Interesting. Very interesting to see here. Absolutely. Let's get into this game. Ian Robb is going to kick things off. He is going first, leading with that Bidoof. Bibarel becoming such a powerful support option for these Charizard players. And it's not the strongest of starts. Ultra Ball is not the Pokemon search card you really want to be leading with with this deck. Yep, having a tough time choosing what else to discard along with the Radiant Charizard. The Radiant Charizard you can recover at some point, of course. And the choice was between Arvin or Iono. Ian deciding to keep the Iono for the follow-up turn, and I'm going to thoroughly check his prize cards after searching for that Charmander. And it is Charmander being brought to the front of the deck at this point. Of course, Ultra Ball allowing Ian to discard two cards from his hand in favor of searching one Pokemon from the deck. Ian kind of wincing, grimacing at the decision he was having to make. Arvin going down is not ideal. It's a really solid option in a future turn. You can get yourself an item card like a Buddy Buddy Poffin, a Rare Candy, an Ultra Ball, whatever you need to keep getting your set up rolling. And also a tool card often comboed with that Forest Seal Stone. It's being down at one of those supporters pretty early. Definitely a little annoying. And he also did prize an Arvin, so he actually has one Arvin left in his deck right now. <laughs> yeah, one out of the three that he does play. So that could come into play, right? Because Arvin is so useful to search for those items and tool cards that you mentioned, Chip. Now... I have to assume that Paul won the coin flip and chose to go second um, given the current situation. And now it's on Paul to really take advantage of Ian's very slow start. Yeah, not the strongest of starts from Ian, mostly because of the discards he had to make. Paul is getting off to the races, though. Flower selecting from that Comfey does send a Grass Energy to the Lost Zone and another Grass Energy going yeah. down in favor of having to keep that Iron Leaves, which is so important in this matchup. But two Grass Energy being down already so early, Pablo, not ideal. Not ideal at all, Chip. Now, I did like how Paul just quickly made the decision. Like, I see a lot of players who... Uh, spend a lot of time like lamenting their yes. situation. Yes. But it's like, this is what I have to do. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I need to have access to Iron Leaves in this particular matchup. Paul ends off the turn with the Abyss Seeking of Giratina V, looking at the top four cards of the deck, adding two to the hand, I believe, finding yet another Grass Energy was very quick to keep that. I'm very much enjoying the pace of play for both of these players. Like you said, Paul making decisions quickly, and Ian is also someone who's known for playing pretty briskly, making quick decisions. Ian's going to lead off his second turn with a Buddy Buddy Poffin, finding a Manaphy and a Charmander, adding those directly to the bench, and then follows it up with that Iono supporter card, shuffling both players' hands to the bottom of the deck. Usually a great response right after your opponent has used Abyss Seeking. Yep, you know they kept two very good cards right therefore putting them at the bottom is going to be very nice now ian's top deck off buddy buddy puffin was very very good into this iono probably searching for either bibrel or charmeleon here 
Uh, no, it's Rotom to get the extra cards. Does have an Arvin, does have a Charizard, so we're definitely going to see Charizard EX hit the board next turn. But as the Giratina player, it's always nice when your opponent doesn't get turned to Charizard. Yeah, I will say as a Charizard player, you don't really uh, necessarily feel the need in this matchup to go super hard to hit into a Giratina right away. You're not taking a prize card. Um, and also, if you do eventually lead the prize trade off, your opponent will unlock some of their comeback mechanic cards. It is going to be back over now to Paul Miller after Ian uses the instant charge from Rotom. Paul immediately benching Radiant Greninja using concealed cards, discarding a basic psychic energy, drawing two from the top of the deck, has a few options here. We'll go with the Nest Ball, the item card of choice, searching the deck for any basic Pokemon, putting it directly onto the bench. A second Giratina V would be pretty nice to establish. No Colrus found, though. That Colrus that he kept from their B seeking is now at the bottom of the deck, as we can see on screen. And so we are probably going to see an B seeking now. As you mentioned, Chip, uh, getting ahead as the Charizard player is it does open up those comeback cards that we were talking about for the Giratina player. However, it is very important to have some damage on the Giratina. Sure. Otherwise, hitting 280 damage is not easy for a Charizard deck in the beginning, in the early stages of the game. And if one Giratina V-Star can potentially knock out a Pidgeot and then V-Star a Charizard EX, that's a very difficult trade to come back from. I honestly may like to see Ian go with a Heat Tackle if he could piece that yeah. together, get a little damage on that Giratina to make it more manageable to KO later on. That, of course, would also open up Ian's comeback cards, having that copy of Counter Catcher in his list. Actually, yeah, two copies of the Counter Catcher for Ian in this tournament. Paul Miller thinking through the last bit of his turn here. It will be the Abyss Seeking and a card inadvertently revealed, I believe, when he was pulling the cards off of his deck to Abyss Seeking. This Chorus fell out of the middle of Paul's deck. Yep. I mean, it, it was clearly accidental. There's nothing to be gained by doing this. It's from the bottom. Now it's been put at the top. It's going to be shuffled here. Yep. It should be shuffled. Shouldn't be. Yeah. Hopefully uh, this is just going to come away as a warning. warning. And I think yeah. that is what it sounds like is going to be. We'll get word and confirmation shortly. I would really hate for something like that to turn into a yeah. prize penalty, especially when we've got a game like this that's shaping up to, to look like a pretty competitive one. Paul is going to just go with the Abyss Seeking immediately, choosing one card to keep, thinking through what the second one should be now. Yeah, it's always tough because anything you send to a loss zone is now gone for the rest of the game. No way to super art it back, no way to pulp it back, oh. and it is a boss's order and, and an another energy. Another energy. That is the third energy card in the loss zone already for Paul Miller with zero lost impacts being utilized. Ian is going to kick off his turn with Arvin. That is the last Arvin remaining in the deck, but it is going to be a great combination of cards here. Found the rare candy and that forest seal stone can piece together the Pidgeot for Ian Rob, which can most likely piece together a Charizard. We're off to the races. Now, as you mentioned, Chip, I love the pace of play from both players. I wish every round we got to see was like this. See Ian establish the Pidgeot. Oh. Rare Candy Charizard has everything in hand ready to go. Has not even used Quick Search yet, so still has that as an option. And it looks like Ian is going to be going in with the Charizard EX as the attacking choice. Quick Search can be utilized at this point. He has already played a supporter card, no counter catcher live, so it is going to be a hit into this Giratina V at this point. Yeah, I think establishing the Beaverill, give yourself backup cards. There was also a little bit of merit of establishing the Charmeleon just so that uh, you have the potential to have an easier Charizard afterwards, but I do like this Beaverill. A lot as well. Any extra resource that you have in case you need to piece something that requires a lot of cards at once goes really well with these two support Pokemon. Burning Darkness dealing just the base 180 damage at this point. Of course, that attack will get more powerful as the game progresses, but Paul Miller yet to strike, yet to take a knockout will only take 180 damage from that attack. Now back over to Paul Miller's turn. He's got quite a few cards in hand, about eight or nine, to kick things off. 
We have not yet seen a Colrus's experiment be played from Paul, but he has still managed to get seven cards in the Lost Zone at this point. And here comes card number seven, Lost Vacuum. We'll get rid of the Forest Seal Stone. It's already been used for Ian Rob, so not too big of a deal, but this gets Paul over that seven card threshold. Mirage Gate now being online. Yep, and with two potential Grass Energy available, we could see the Iron Leaves to take down the Charizard. We could also potentially see a boss's orders Giratina V star take down the pidget but with one boss's orders up here I'm not sure if there's another copy chip there is there is two cop there are two copies of boss's orders yes yeah, yeah two, copies two copies of boss in Paul's list so we'll need to find that other copy does have a couple copies of pokey gear to potentially dig for it later on Mirage Gate will throw a couple of energy cards onto the active. Second Mirage Gate incoming. Two more energy cards being put into play. That Iron Leaves play is available. Yep. And is it in Paul's hand already? It is. It is in Paul's hand, I do believe. So can be absorbing this grass, probably the water, this grass as well, switching immediately and taking down the Charizard, which always feels really nice, right? In this 2-2-2 two -two -two price trade that we're always talking about, this is a way to do it. We will see the switch cart actually getting a bit of a healing factor into the mix here using the flower selecting in order to look at the top two cards. We'll add one to hand, send one to Lost Zone. It's a Giratina V-Star and some other card. Didn't quite catch what it was. Paul having to think about it for just a moment. I think it might have been a chorus. No, it's a, a it's Mirage, Mirage Gate. Gate. Okay. Oof. And right. here it is, that Iron Leaves being put into play. Rapid Vernier bringing it into the active spot. And Prism Edge incoming will take the one-hit knockout on Charizard EX. Now, this is an ideal situation for Paul. You have this threat that you, your opponent has to deal with no matter what. And you have your Giratina V-Star completely out of range of another Charizard EX hit as they're only doing 240 damage right now. Even with a choice belt, they'd still be 10 damage short. You know, what's pretty interesting as well is that Paul using the switch cart is going to put this Kiratina V out of range of some sort of heat tackle plus choice belt or defiance yeah. band play that Ian maybe could have gone for. So now Ian will be forced to get through this Iron Leaves by potentially putting another Charizard in play maybe his only way to deal with this Pokemon, and that's going to open him up to being hit with a potential Star Requiem or maybe even another Iron Leaves EX. Yep, there is the possibility of Supra. Now, three Mirage Gates have been exhausted, right? There's two over here. There's this one over here. So getting more energy into play will be a little problematic for Paul potentially in the future. So it's very important to keep that in mind and be as cost efficient as you can be and make that last Mirage Gate count. Ian Rob playing the Super Odd will shuffle up to three Pokemon and basic energy from the discard pile back into the deck, choosing two basic fire energy and that Radiant Charizard certainly going to be a strong option to potentially close out the game here for Ian Rob. Has the Bibarel to still use Industrious Incisors will be a draw of four cards here. Finding a Charizard EX for a future turn. Both of the energy that I think he just put back. And then Lost Vacuum, not going to be super useful at this point. In fact, it is unplayable with no tools or stadiums in play. Burning Darkness takes the KO. Ian Robb able to tie things up. What is Paul Miller's response? Eight cards currently in the Lost Zone. If he can get to two more and find a Grass Energy, Star Requiem will be online. And finding the Grass Energy here could be the issue, Pablo. Yep. We know where all four Grass Energy are. Yeah, there's two up here. There's two in the discard pile. And funnily enough, there's still four Colrus left in the deck. Not a single Colrus has been played so far. So, Paul, this might be the turn where he has to take a small break. He does have Supra to recover the grass energies. But is that fourth Mirage Gate in the hand? That would be a big question here, and I'm not sure that I see it. He's going to dig a little bit further with Flower selecting number two. Top two cards being surveyed here. Will he finally find a Colrus? Not quite. I think it is a Poke Gear 3.0, but is actually going to choose to get rid of that, keeping the Temple of Sinnoh. Interesting. I mean, I, maybe at this point, oh, there is a Colrus in hand. Maybe the Temple of Sinnoh, in case, uh, Paul, like, Paul doesn't know Ian's exact 60 cards. He might expect a missed energy, so trying to play around that possibility. We have the privilege of having the information of knowing that there isn't any missed energy to worry about, but Paul doesn't know that. 
yeah, I think it's pretty wise to keep that option hanging around at least. Keep yourself having an ability to pull off the one-hit KO if necessary, and especially in a situation like this where you may not be getting a knockout this turn. The only way Paul's going to be able to do that is if he can use Radiant Greninja to potentially draw into a Grass Energy. He has concealed cards available. Oh, but he's got that fourth Boom. Mirage Gate. <laughs> that is a huge a card to have here in the hand. This is going to line up very nicely for Paul Miller. That is a very great card to have indeed. Will allow him to start wreck him. Also has the jet energy ready to go to bring this Giratina to the active already. So going to go down to two prizes and one uh, hidden blessing, if you will, for Paul of not finding those Colruses early is that even if Ian plays Roxanne or Iono, there's still plenty of potential draw for Paul. Not only the Colruses, but also Roxanne. And Roxanne more than likely will be Ian Rob's play this coming turn. Ian's going to have a pretty solid response to this Giratina V-Star in the form of Radiant Charizard. He already has Ultra Ball, Choice Belt, and the like in the hand. But actually, Ooh. it will be the Prime Catcher being used this yeah. turn, going with the Lost Impact keeping around the option of Star Requiem to take this final prize. Yep, no V-Star being utilized just quite yet, so it might be this hero, Giratina V, that becomes a V-Star, and with a single energy attachment, now that there's no Mirage Gates available, will be able to take down the Charizard. And with no Pidgeot for Ian Rob, can he piece enough cards to find the Radiant Charizard, the Choice Belt, and the Fire Energy? I think he has all of those cards in hand. He has Ultra Ball. He has Choice Belt, and he has the Fire Energy. Does not have a Disruption Supporter. I think that is the one thing that Ian Rob would love to find here, and he may have to rely on Industrious Incisors to get him there. Here comes the Ultra Ball, finding out that Radiant Charizard potentially. No, it will be Luminion, really valuing the potential of Roxanne coming into the mix. And that is going to be the choice here for Ian, crossing his fingers. Radiant Charizard no longer an option. Yep, not choosing to go for that, just trying to go for the direct knockout on this Giratina, putting the boss's orders back to try and hunt down this Giratina for his last two prize cards. So can Paul peace out Giratina V-Star and a Grass Energy off of a two-card hand? Ian is going to be leaving it up to fate here. Is Roxanne a lie? That is the big question at this point. <laughs> Playing that card, Ian will shuffle his hand into the deck as Paul does the same. Ian will get six cards from the supporter played this turn. Paul will be limited to just two. As you mentioned, though, plenty of Colrus still hanging around in Paul's deck. But there are also a ton of unuseful cards at this point that could come back to bite Paul. He has plenty of draw options available with the flower selecting. He's got Radiant Greninja in play as well. Ian Robb finding his six cards. We'll throw that maximum belt onto the Beaver Hell. <laughs> Don't think we're going to be seeing a tail smash. It will just be the knockout. Burning Darkness Paul immediately promotes the Comfey. Draws return. What does he have? No Mirage Gates available anymore. We're going to see a Nest Bolt to start off with the thinning. Iron Leaves is back in the deck, which I really wonder if that was a good choice because yeah. with no more Mirage Gates, your right. chance of using it are probably not great, and it's not a card you want to find in this situation, right? Energies become draw for the Greninja, but what is that Iron Leaves doing with no Mirage Gates available? Paul needs effectively a three-card combo. He must find a Grass Energy, he must find a Giratina V-Star, and then also a way to get it active, be it a Switch, a Jet Energy, some combination there is what he needs. A Colrus's experiment would certainly be a welcome addition to the hand, and it will be a Giratina V sent to the Lost Zone. Looks like a Temple of Sinnoh kept at this time. We do see Sableye hitting the board. No potential of that being a game-winning card. It will just be it. the Temple of Sinnoh being put in play and the pass, and Ian Rob has the boss's orders to KO Giratina V. Taking the win, we're going to game two. Ian Rob with the victory. Ian Rob with... A very solid display of why Charizard is so powerful. And even though Giratina has the V-Star, has the Iron Leaves, it can still not deal with Charizard sometimes. And really important to mention how Paul accomplished everything he did without using a single Colrus until very, very late in the game. So even though he had a few Colrus and Roxanne to draw off of that Roxanne that Ian played, there really were also so many other cards that were not useful.
few too many grass energies sent to the lost zone early on for Paul Miller could be all the difference in this one. Not even having the option to have some extra energy cards hanging around in play. Yep. Definitely could hurt him at the end of this game. It was Paul striking first with that first KO. Prism Edge knocking out Charizard EX. Ian did have the response with his Charizard to get revenge for its fallen brother. And Paul had a strong option this turn. Prime Catcher KOing the Pidgeot EX. Lost zoning a couple of energy cards, but saving the Star Requiem. And Ian found the Roxanne line through the Luminion V. Forced Paul to find all of the pieces off of just two cards, one single flower selecting. He was unable to get a Colrus, unable to get an energy to use concealed cards. And Ian had the game winning boss waiting in hand. Yep. Too strong that Charizard deck. Even though Pidgeot was gone, Ian was able to find exactly what he needed at the right time and chose to take a risk, right? He could have gone for the Radiant Charizard play, as you mentioned, wouldn't have attacked Paul's hand, which at that point was quite significant. So he evaluated how, what, what's my best chance at winning? Do I go for the Radiant Charizard and hope my opponent doesn't have the three card, com the four card combo, the Giratina V Star, the Grass, the Way to Switch, and the boss's orders, or do I attack their hand and hope they can have a three card combo, but with a much lower number of cards in hand? And it seems to have paid off for Ian. It is a pair of mulligans for Paul to kick things off. That means Ian will have more cards to work with. We've actually gotten word that Paul has chosen to go first here in this game. What do you think of that decision in this matchup? Paul wanting to go first as the Giratina V-Star player. Honestly, very peculiar decision. Maybe Ian actually chose to go first uh, in game one, and therefore he's trying to choose the opposite of what Ian wants. Uh, going first as Giratina allows you to get that acceleration a little bit into the Lost Zone. If you get a picture-perfect start and you get three cards into a Lost Zone with Triple Comfy, that does open up the threat of Greninja for the next turn as well, combined with a Colrus and a couple of Comfy. So there is merit to that early aggression. Some interesting prizes for both of the players. Paul has prized his one copy of Cramorant. That is something that could be a bit of a bummer. Rescue board also in the prize cards. Once again, Ian Rob prizing his one pal pad. We saw that being a really strong option in the first game to recover boss's orders. And speaking of boss, that also is in the prize cards for Ian Rob. Paul Miller kicks things off with the Radiant Greninja, immediately using concealed cards. Discards the basic psychic energy, drawing two more now into the flower selecting of the Comfey. Looking at the top two, sending yet another Comfey to the Lost Zone in favor of keeping the Giratina. Already has another Comfey in the hand. We'll see if there is a switch card to accompany this to get another card in the Lost Zone here on turn one. Yeah, really good start here for Paul. Straightforward, get double Giratina into play, double Comfey, and make sure you're building up that loss zone as soon as you can. Now, the mana fee start is pretty significant. If Paul had been able to use Cramorant to take it down, then that would open up potentially the Radiant Granger play. But as we know, Cramorant is unfortunately hiding in the prize cards. And as Paul is finding out at this moment, perhaps, as he is doing his first deck search with the Nest Ball being played, this can get a second Giratina V established. You don't necessarily have to go for two Giratina V right away on turn one, but you probably do at some point want to have multiple in play. With two Comfey already in play, one in the Lost Zone, the fourth Comfey could also be an option here from the Nest Wall. Yeah, third Comfey, as you mentioned, does open up a quicker Mirage Gate play, which is always very nice, but I also like having that double Giratina option because it is likely that you'll have to be seeking potentially next turn, and you definitely want to have the backup full HP Giratina to follow that up. As we are getting into this game here with Paul's retreat into this second comfy, we can give a quick update of the other games out on the floor. Six players were sitting at 35 or more match points going into this round. They all six played one another, so our top three tables were 35 match points or greater, and they all chose to intentionally draw this last round, meaning that um, is automatically putting six players at potential of making it into top eight, but they are running a potential risk with the bubble being a very real threat. The only person definitely safe is Grant Shin moving to 37 match points. Ian Robb kicks off his first turn immediately, probably with the best card you hope to see in your opening hand as a Charizard player. Buddy, Buddy Poffin immediately searching out the Pidgey and the Charmander, putting those directly onto the bench. A quick scan of the deck, checking for some prize cards for Ian. 
now surveying the hand to figure out where to go from here. Looks like an Ultra Ball is the potential option. I do also see, I believe, an Arvin in the hand. Yeah, Arvin for an extra body body pop in would certainly be good. And I always find it fascinating how the different players have different uh, ways to check the price cards, right? Some players put all the Pokemon at the front, all the energy at the back. Other players just go through their deck multiple times to see and figure that out. So I think that's what we're seeing with Ian before determining, all right, my play is the Arvin. Make sure I establish an extra Charmander in case there's a potential Colrus plus Prime Catcher, which that Prime Catcher play and the fact that you can now Ghost and Colrus at the same time does make uh, Cramorant a much bigger threat than usual. Arvin is going to find Buddy Buddy Poffin and the Forest Seal Stone, so unlikely we'll see something like a Rotom in play. I think Ian does have an Ultra Ball and an Energy, so that means that uh, that means that either the choice of Cleffa or Rotom could be available. I wonder if he can thin his hand down low enough to make good value, good use of the Cleffa. Okay, I thought Ian was only grabbing one Pokemon off Still the Still thinking through it, yeah. yeah. Seems like we're going to see something else grab, potentially a Pidgey, if he wants to uh, retreat this mana feed to protect it so that you have the guaranteed protection, and then give up, you give up a Pidgey in order to um, sacrifice something. But no, it seems like third Charmander is the choice. And with the shuffle of the deck, that signals that that Ultra Ball will be saved for a potential stage two next turn. No Rotom being put into play, simply a pass. Over to Paul Miller, Ian making note of what cards were in the prize cards. And Paul Miller already having a much better start than in the first game. Has a Colrus's experiment on turn number two. Looking at the top five cards, adding three to hand. Two will fuel that lost zone, bumping Paul up to four. There is still the possibility of a quick Mirage Gate, but feels much less useful when your opponent has that Manaphy in play. The quick shred with Giratina V doesn't seem like a great play when your opponent would just be able to respond with the KO. So more than likely, as you mentioned, Abyss Seeking will be incoming shortly. Yeah, I think getting to eight, waiting for your opponent to establish any two price threat, right? The Pidgeot, the Charizard X, so that you can be more cost effective, not only with your energies, but also with your attacks and your price card. So as Giratina, you want to be um, like, take it. Slow and steady, wins the race, get those double Kiratinas, build up your loss zone, and have every attack available. And if Ian misses a beat, then you can potentially use Sableye to take down two prize cards in a single turn. We will see Flower selecting number two. Finds a Super Odd and a boss's orders. Does send that Super Odd to the loss zone. Also worth noting, Paul did send a Colrus's experiment to the loss zone off of that initial Colrus that was played. And Temple of Sinnoh being put into play early for Paul Miller. Back over now to Ian Robb, who is going to put the Lumineon V in play using that Luminous Sign ability to search the deck for any supporter card, adding it to the hand, and it looks like Iona will be the choice. Yeah, no way to guarantee the Pidgeot, it seems, or unless he already has the pieces that he needs in his hand. Does have the Forest Seal Stone, right? That was searched the previous turn. So maybe we're going to see Pidgeot set up into Iono, and then if you find Red Candy, you quick search for Charizard. If you find Charizard, you quick search for Red Candy, and you are good to go. But now, what if you already have the Charizard in your hand? <laughs> Do you just use the quick search before your supporter? I would say so, yeah. 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 And that's well, the situation I think Ian finds himself in, as quick yep. search will be used immediately for the second rare candy. Now, I want to shout out this rare candy. This rare candy is like 15 years old, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, I think originally from Great the Great Encounters expansion, yep. I want to say. Diamond yeah. and Pearl, 2009, 2008, yeah. somewhere in there. Definitely an old school look. Uh, Ian was a young boy back then, but yeah. <laughs> he was playing the Pokemon TCG. Ian actually has had, you know, we talked about his master's accomplishment, obviously a five-time regional champion. He got second place at NAIC last season, losing to Cyrus Davis. But he's also a runner-up at the World Championships in the juniors division, losing back in 2012, I want to say, maybe 2011, to Gustavo Wada, who won that World Championships. Yeah, so Ian, despite his young age, I would say a veteran of the game, honestly. Absolutely. We do you see that Charmeleon being established? First time we're seeing it hit the field in this set. 
Vidian will be putting on the pressure here. Retreating Manaphy, Burning Darkness KOs the Kumfei. Forcing Paul Miller to have some answers. A great time to take this KO right after using Iono. Paul had had time to build up a pretty sizable hand. And what is he going to have here? It will be Coors' experiment. A great way to lead off the turn. Five cards from the top. Looking for some way to piece together an attack. Potentially that Iron Leaves being worked into the mix. Will Paul be able to find all the cards necessary? Yeah, with the Comfy going down after this call res, Paul can realistically get to 9 in the Lost Zone, but getting to 10 might be a little out of range. So either the Iron Leaves or a potential Counter Catcher or Prime Catcher KO on this Pidgeot would be Paul's ideal play here. Mirage Gate now online. Eight cards in the Lost Zone. It will be two basic energy cards of differing types pulled from the deck, put directly into play. Basic Psychic Energy and Basic Grass being the choice. I do think there was already another Basic Grass Energy in the hand. So if Paul can find specifically the Iron Leaves, he would be able to pull that playoff. Now, the interesting thing about Iron Leaves is that its ability only works when it is put from the hand onto the bench. You cannot use it via Nest Ball being the option. So Paul will have to find that Iron Leaves itself specifically. Nest Ball will not do. Really great sequencing here by Paul, using the Colrus, thinning the energies off of the Mirage Gate, leading into the Concealed Cards, leading into the Confei. So, And I think Paul was able to find his Lost Vacuum as well. That is how Paul can get to 10 cards in the Lost Zone this turn. So Star yeah. Requiem already online, assuming Paul has a Switch card in the hand, and he has done a great job of finding tons of cards off of Ian's Iono from the last turn. I think it is going to line up pretty nicely here for Star Requiem. Now, as a Giratina player, which do you prefer to lead with, I guess, is the question. Is it the Star Requiem first, or do you prefer the early Prism Edge? Which would be better? I would say the early Prism Edge is ideal, but I think the best sequencing would, or the, the ideal scenario would be to take down the Pidgeot somehow. But if you have to deal with Charizard, I think sure. you want to do it with the Iron Leaves so that they have to deal with Iron Leaves and your Giratina can still Star Requiem whatever is in front. Does not look like we have seen the... And pretty interesting there to see the Jet yeah. Energy attach retreats. Being, oh, because of the Temple of Sin. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, choosing not, he could have Lost Zoned it, but I yep. guess wants to leave it in play. Still isn't totally sure if a Mist Energy could be hanging around for Ian, but if you're using your V-Star Power right now, which is what we saw Paul do, you know, maybe Temple could have gotten uh, bumped there as opposed to that for Seal Stone. As it stands, though, Paul taking two prize cards, jumping ahead in the prize trade. Ian promotes the Pidgeot EX after the KO. Of course, that Pokemon so powerful with its quick search ability, but also having free retreat makes it an excellent pivot. And speaking of quick search, that is what Ian will use right away, bringing Charizard EX to the front of the deck as an option, already moving the fire energies around. One of the nice things about getting that Charmeleon in play is that it makes it much easier in following turns to get Charizard EXs established and even actually has a rare candy, so Charmeleon can be an option later on. Yep, setting up the Charizard or the final Charizard through Charmeleon much easier than finding the two card combo that you mentioned, Chip. Now, Ian does have a clear knockout on this Giratina if he has access to Prime Catcher or Counter Catcher or anything of the sort, but this is the ideal situation for Paul because this Giratina is out of range of pretty much everything other than a Radiant Charizard as we see the counter catcher being played. It will be the counter catcher being played. Ian having a quick ask of how many cards are in Paul's hand. Thinking for just a moment, I agree with you, Pablo. It does seem like the pretty clear choice would be the Giratina V, but could Ian be thinking of something else here? Might be. I mean, he's definitely having extra considerations. Is it going after the Comfey? Yeah, it seems I, like ooh, it. Oh, this is kind of a, I think, a late game play from Ian Robb. He is thinking through the fact that he's going to have to be utilizing Roxanne or Iono later on in this game and wants to take Paul's draw power out while he can right now. Yeah, as well as not putting himself in Roxanne range, which he has Pidgeot, but he doesn't have Beaverall set up to potentially get extra resources. As we see the third straight Colors experiment played by Paul, completely different from game one and in a really good spot, I would say. Now, hoping to find... This also doesn't activate uh, Counter Catcher yes, for true, Paul true. either, so Ian really thinking about potentially 
every possibility and forcing the most resources out of Paul. But yeah, really heads up decision there from Ian, right? I think many players would have seen the Giratina and yeah. chased the prize Two cards prizes. right away. Yay. Yeah, and <laughs> honestly, that could have been Ian's potential downfall as now he has played around the counter catcher effectively. He has played around the Roxanne as well, but what he cannot play around is Iron Leaves EX. Rapid Vernier sending it to the active spot. Prism Edge will be picking up this one-hit KO. And Ian will be looking for the response on his side. Third Giratina hitting the field. Second Giratina V-Star hitting the field. Last Super Odd being played. Two of them have been sent to the Lost Zone, so that Super Odd was very, very key as we're going to see a Mirage Gate establish more energies on the board. And this is an ideal situation for Paul, where even though he doesn't have his V-Star anymore, Ian needs to deal with the Iron Leaf ZX. Doesn't have any other choice, pretty much, as it can even take down the Luminion, potentially. And if your opponent wants to take down this Giratina V-Star, then they have to use a Charizard, therefore, they have the Iron Leaf. So this Giratina V-Star is very, very well covered here. We are seeing a situation, though, where Paul is once again going to need quite a lot on the final turn. He has yep. plenty of things available, still has boss's orders, prime catchers, all yep. of those things, but he's going to need to find them off of a potential disruption supporter from Ian. And right away, it's going to be a very similar situation to our first game. <laughs> Ian, when facing a two-prize card deficit, four to two, utilizes Roxanne, takes a knockout, We'll see where things can develop from here. Badoof will be put into play as well. No rats are available now. Collapse Stadium will get rid of the Luminion. Not too big of a deal at this point. If Paul can knock out Luminion, he can also most likely knock out Pidgeot EX. Yep. That attachment on the mana fee is very interesting. Like, why wouldn't you attach here? What if you draw the Charizard along with fire energies or enough fire energies to where you can't power yourself up? Yeah, there is a, definitely a potential where Ian, or maybe it's, I actually am not sure how many fire energies are in the discard pile. Maybe Ian is going to have to find the combination of Super, Super Odd plus Charizard yeah. anyway, right? And if that's the case, Manaphy is the thing you would want to retreat into this turn. Potential. That could be the situation we find ourselves in. There's the Ultra Ball. Does Ian find the Super Odd? I do, do believe he did. Yep. Super Odd will be shuffling back. Some fire energy cards will be three. And yes, yeah, sure enough, all five of Ian's other fire energies were yeah. in the discard pile, so he knew that he was going to have to find Super Odd to pull off the attack this turn. Ultra Ball found in combination with it, accelerating two fire energy from the deck into play right onto the Charizard EX. And Ian is asking the question to Paul Miller, do you have it? Do you have boss plus energy? And I want to emphasize how if Paul had gotten rid of his Does he have stadium. it? He's uh, got it! He <laughs> what a draw! Roxanne not coming through for Ian Robb. And we're going to game three on the winning end to top eight. I was about to say how that Temple of Sino, where he had to attach the jet to retreat, could have instead left an energy on the Giratina V-Star, but turns out Roxanne is a lie chip. <laughs> it came through for Ian in game number one. Yep. So we're, you know, we're batting 50 -50. even here, right? <laughs> Keep it on average, but yeah, sometimes you go for the right play, which is what Ian Robb did, and they just have it. Paul Miller finding the perfect two-card combo off of Roxanne. One immense difference from game one, though, was certainly the amount of call risk that Paul played this yes, game. Yeah. Therefore, his deck size was so much smaller than the previous game, right? So that increases your chances of finding that two-card combo. What a game number two it was. Ian Robb jumping off to the early lead, the fast Charizard EX, able to take the knockout. Temple of Sinnoh did remain in play on Paul Miller's end after he took this two prize KO. Ian, very wisely, I would say, played around the potential of a counter catcher of a Roxanne from Paul by utilizing counter catcher of his own to KO the Comfey here, which also did decrease Paul's chances here in this last turn, theoretically, but Sometimes they've just got it. Yeah, sometimes they've just got it, Chip. Feels like more often than not if you're the one playing their Roxanne, but realistically, that's how the game goes, right? There's always, always a chance, no matter how small, you can play into it. And we saw Paul draw the two perfect cards into the knockout of the Pidget.
players setting up for game number three. Once again here, Paul Miller has mulliganed once and is now debating which Pokemon to start. Like, Ian did yeah. choose to go second here in this game, and look at that, mm. two rare candy in the prize cards for Ian Rob. Also, Radiant Charizard being prized two games in a row. Two games in a row, and now it's at the very top zone, likely to be utilized throughout the whole game. All the while, Paul had a couple supporters oh, prized. I think Paul drew past. Oh. Ian Rob chose to go second. My. Yep. Paul drew past. Ian uses the Arvin Buddy Buddy Poffin is going to get a immense lead here with the setup. Paul Miller, Cramorant pass. That's not how we draw it up. That's not how we draw it up. Indeed, Chip, as Ian is flying through his cards, has the possibility to just get a perfect bench, draw three extra cards, and threatens the rare candy Charizard for game next turn, unless Paul, I mean, hopefully he's holding a Colrus, and that's part of the draw pass. Of course, you can play it if you go first, right. but hopefully we see that. I mean, I see a more stable setup for Paul. Speaking of stable setups, Ian Robb has an excellent start with a pair of Buddy Buddy Poffin, immediately utilizing that Forest Seal Stone, the Star Alchemy V-Star Power. Makes me believe that Ian already is sitting on the option to potentially get the turn to attack. And we'll draw three more with the Instant Charge to end the turn off. And Paul is able to find another basic and also has the Chorus. Okay, we can take... A sigh of relief here. We're going to see a game three. We're definitely going to see a game three. And we have 10 minutes left on the clock chip. So hopefully that is enough to determine a winner. And as both players are playing for their potential spot in top eight, I think if Paul wins, he's definitely in. Yes. If Ian wins, he's on the bubble. So we'll have to see what happens. Yeah, Paul Miller coming into this match at 34 match points. Ian Robb at 33, of course, 36 being the minimum to have a chance to make it. And you get three match points for a win, just one for a tie. And the pace at which these players have been playing throughout the entire game makes me think that definitely by the time we get to zeros on the game clock, with the plus three turns factored in, we will more than likely be seeing a winner. Now from a draw pass to five cards in the lost zone after this at BC What a game. turn. Yep, definitely puts Paul in a much more comfortable situation than we thought. However, Ian will be able to get this potential first hit into the Giratina, which is so, so important. Yeah, what a massive turnaround from the situation that Paul found himself in. Ian has plenty of cards to work with. Rare Candy into Pidgeot EX is a great start. And Quick Search will be used right away. Charizard EX already in the hands. That second copy of Rare Candy, the only other Rare Candy in Ian's deck at the yeah. moment, will be found. Which is more than enough, right? Those two Rare Candies is what you want, especially in the early game. And hopefully Ian is able to unlock. Now, he does play double Charmeleon, so that will definitely play or help with the fact that he prized two Rare Candies, which is really, really good to see. As and long as he can find one. I'm not sure that yeah. he has a way to get the other Charmeleon at yep. the moment. It's definitely something he would like to see. I think it is going to be an Iono more than likely as the supporter for Ian this turn. Yeah, even an Arvin for a little trouble to set it up. And it is so clutch, right? Because now with five cards in the Lost Zone, there is a threat of the Iron Leaves taking a knockout yes. on the Charizard. And even with the Radiant Charizard prized as well, it could be really difficult for Ian to piece anything afterwards. Yeah, and honestly, the way the prize cards were set out as well, both of Ian's rare candies were up at the top yep. of the prize cards. So he really would like to find a Charmeleon here. And I'm not sure he was able to. And I don't even know if he can thin this hand out anymore to draw with Beaverell's Industrious Incisors. Yeah, that's five unplayable cards remaining in this hand. Yeah, can't play Buddy Buddy Puffin. So Ian probably considering, is it even worth attacking because of his prizes? I think if he had one rare candy available, he would... Even he wouldn't even be thinking about it, but because it is priced, because there is the potential for the Charizard EX to go down, and he has no follow up afterwards, I don't think he's going. It's correct to attack with the Charizard. Yep. Yeah, he's going with the heat tackle here. It looks like 30 damage laid onto Giratina V does make it much easier to KO later on in the game. If you're going to two hit KO it, why put your Charizard EX at risk to kick things off? Paul does have the immediate response with that switch cart. Gets rid of that 30 damage, taking. Uh, it really does mess with a lot of the potential math that Ian could go for. It takes it out of range of a Giratina V-Star being KO'd when Paul has taken three prize cards. It means that Giratina V can't be KO'd whenever Paul has taken just one prize card. 
And he is going to use Flower Selecting now. It does finally have that Rescue Board in play, a constant pivot available through the Comfey. And Cramorant is already online to let Paul strike this turn if he wants. Yep. Uh, would allow him to get ahead in the prize cards, would open up those Giratina Vs to potentially be taken down by a choice build plus costing option as well. However, this Comfey will get to Paul, will get Paul to seven cards in the Lost Zone and will activate Mirage Gate. Now, if you're not planning on using a Comfey, I really would have liked to see the concealed cards before even benching the Comfey. It's just a small thing, but you never know. Yeah, because now by benching it, and drawing the Colrus, now you yep. don't have the option to potentially Prime Catcher, use Iron Leaves, KO the Charizard. And there's the Prime Catcher right there. Is the Iron Leaves available? Because that would have been really strong for Paul. However unlikely it could have been, he may have actually found all the cards to potentially have pulled off that play. Yeah. But it's cut off because he put that Comfe into play. Yeah, he does have the Nest Ball, which could fetch the... Iron Leaves, and even attach, though you're not going to yep, use its yep. ability, you can attach to it, Mirage Gate onto it, and you're good to go. So a small misstep by Paul, and something very important to remember, just because you have that bench space open, like you can do that at the very end. One of the golden rules I always tell people, interact with the deck before the field. Paul could always bench that Comfey. Didn't necessarily have to do it right now. And with the Mirage Gate being played, I think Paul would have had the Iron Leaves KO on Charizard this turn if he wanted it. Now, if there are enough water energies, though, Ian was not able oh. to protect the bench, so we could see a Radiant Greninja KO on both Charmanders. Is that play available? It, it seems like it is. Paul has a water energy in the hand, and it looks like the answer to that question is yes. Radiant Greninja will be able to Moonlight Shuriken, taking two prize cards for Paul Miller, letting him jump ahead and also eliminating two Charmander from play, forcing Ian to find more to create secondary backup Charizards. And with his rare candies being prized as well, that is yep. one turn away from a Charmeleon being put into play. Yeah, now by taking the prizes, both of these Giratina or either of these Giratina could be KO'd, but the rare candies are in the top four prizes, Chip. Not liking the odds here for Ian, unfortunately. Now, Paul will discard both water energies. Pretty interesting with the Moonlight Shuriken. Taking the knockout on two Charmanders, jumping far ahead. We'll see what response Ian Rob has. Is he going to go after a Giratina V? It would be very strong. He's got plenty of ways to do it through the Counter Catcher. Boss's Orders, Choice Belt. He's already got that Counter Catcher in the hand. Buddy Buddy Poffin can find Charmander from the deck, put it directly onto the bench. We maybe even see Jirachi accompany this to prevent any potential Sableye plays. No, it will just be the Charmander. I mean, if you go Jirachi and KO the Giratina, nothing's stopping Paul from just doing it all over again, right? Sure, KO sure. Jirachi and KO in Charmander. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would have liked to see Manaphy. There's no uh, other threat, right, or no other prize that uh, Paul could take by knocking out this Charmander. So I think that's why we're not seeing that last bench space being occupied. But as you mentioned, Chip, that Charmander cannot become Charmeleon. So if the Charizard already goes down, Ian has no way to produce another attacker immediately. It will be an Iono from Ian Rob That will limit Paul Miller. Let's see what the four cards yield for him. Ian will have six to work with now, drawing off the top of the deck. Doesn't really need much else this turn. He's already used his Quick Search, his Bibarel, I do believe. I know Quick Search actually being used now, able yep. to find any card from the deck. He's got just about everything he needs at this point. Is there anything else you'd like to see Ian go with right now? I mean, already has a Charmeleon in hand. Yeah, I mean, maybe a follow-up supporter, another Iono for next turn, just in case, uh, or a boss's orders preemptively, maybe a Professor Turo. Does choose the Ultra Ball to potentially search for Charizard, I guess expecting just to find for one rare turn. candy yeah, sure. to immediately get the Charizard going and also get rid of excess resources. And this is a nice find as well. The Lost Vacuum found Paul even saying, I'm not too sure about that. Come on, I'm not <laughs> a fan of that. And look at those prize cards for Ian Rob. Two rare candy. He is definitely gritting his teeth right yep. now. Crossing his fingers that this active Charizard is not able to be KO'd by Paul Miller. And he may not even need Iron Leaves only one card away from being to 10. Star Requiem could be online. And he's going to cross that threshold now with the Flower Selecting. Yeah, the, the, the drawback of sending that, loss, uh, that Rescue Board to the Lost Zone is precisely that you add to your opponent's Lost Zone, right? So it's a, a win-lose sort of... A choice, you eliminate the free retreat, but you also give them an extra card yeah. to the loss. Yeah. 
And I think Paul is going to be pretty close here to have it. Yeah, there's yes. those two cards to Very the side. Clear which cards yep. they are. Yeah, we got to make sure we <laughs> decide what we're sending to the Lost Zone before we add any cards to our hand. It will be Switch in favor of keeping an energy card. There's the Giratina V-Star. There's a there's Mirage a gate. gate. Oh, no. And Ian sitting back in his seat. He knows this is not a good situation. I don't think he can attack next turn outside of a heat tackle. Yeah, I think the prizes might have determined this game for Ian. Otherwise, he would have been in a decent situation if he could produce another Charizard since Paul doesn't have another Giratina available, right? It might be game over unless he can do the Iron Leafs play out of a two-card Iono or Rock's hand. But given oh, the current situation... Hang on. Hang on. One energy found yeah. off the Mirage Gate. He's got a Psychic in hand, but does he have a switch? Oh, my god! Does he have a way to get Giratina into the active? He just sent a switch to the Lost Zone. Yeah, so the Hold red, on. Because he, he found the... He yet. doesn't have it yet. Yeah. He's got to dig. Concealed cards. He needs a Psychic energy which he may already have. And there's oh. a switch card. Does he have the second Psychic? No, I don't think he does. There's one Psychic in the discard, one in the Lost Zone, and one over here. Oh, my gosh. This is going to work out, I think, for Ian Rob. Paul Miller is going to miss the attack this turn. And you have to wonder if Paul should have played the Mirage Gate before using the Flower Select, right? Because yeah. he had that maybe. choice between the Psychic and the Grass. He I mean, the Psychic and the Switch. He maybe didn't totally know what was in his deck still. Wasn't totally aware of how many energy cards were available. If even another Water Energy was around, he could have used that to retreat Oof. his active. And Ian is able to breathe a sigh of relief and does find a Charmeleon to get established. That Charmeleon might be the MVP for Ian at this point. Gets the first hit into this. Giratina will not necessarily stop Paul from taking a knockout, but Ian also has the information that there isn't a cold risk in Paul's hand. There isn't a psychic most likely available at this point in time. There's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. So that Giratina might be stuck for a whole turn. What a close margin here. Ian Robb was so close to just being way too far behind in this game. But perhaps a slight missequence. I'm not sure what Paul could have done differently. But he is unable to attack last turn. Yep. Can't bench that Giratina with collapsed in play. And he just has to pass. He has nothing. Absolutely nothing in hand. And Ian Robb is going to take down this Giratina V-Star. Ian is off to the races here. He can establish another Charizard EX. No. Time has been called. I believe Ian was turn zero. Therefore, that was turn one for Paul. Ian is turn two. So. No, Ian. Paul turn zero. Wait, we're getting confirmation. Getting confirmation here from the stage. Paul oh, was Paul indeed turn zero. zero. All right. So Ian is turn one here of time, yep. which means Ian actually may not be able to close out this game. Yeah, because Paul thought about benching the Giratina, but ended up deciding not to. Ian finally gets a rare candy oh, out of the prize cards. What if but... Ian hadn't played the Collapsed? Oh, Paul would have put the Giratina down. They Paul would have put it down. Stadium. Flower selecting, looking at the top two. Paul can ensure that this game ends in a tie. That would eliminate both players from top cut, which would be a sad end to this extremely close match. But there is so much to play for here at this point. I mean, 35 match points guarantees that Paul would come away with a top 16 finish. I mean, you're talking about uh, $2,000. You're talking about 80, tons, championship, uh, yeah, 80 points. championship points. You're talking about a bunch of booster Ooh. boxes as well compared to the top 32 finish. You would never be able to fault Paul for that. But it's going to feel so bad for Ian because he is so close to locking this up. He is so, so close. And he got pretty unlucky with his prize cards. And he got decently lucky with what happened in the game after Paul's very underwhelming start. And then that Mirage Gate not being played before the Flower Select might have decided Paul's fate in wow. this game where he could have run away with it, right? and potentially been the wow. victor. If Ian had not put the collapsed stadium in play, Paul was going to bench the Giratina. Yeah. He wanted to bench it. And, and that would couldn't. have been Ian's win condition right away. Now, there may be a discussion here. I'm not sure if these players have any sort of gentleman's agreement. That is definitely a part of the game here. Paul is going to prime catcher up the Bibrel. 
trying to stall for a turn. See what would have potentially happened. Ian has the answer with the Professor Turo to pick this up. Ian explaining, hey, I think I would have won this game if we yep. had enough time. This is Kramer at this gone. Ian will be at one prize card, and there's no threat to a Charizard. And even if it does go down, there is the back of Charizard to take down whatever Paul did. No stalling options available to Paul Miller on this final turn, and it does sound like Paul Miller is going to concede. I think that's the words we heard. We'll get confirmation, and that should be Ian Robb moving to 36 match points, crossing his fingers. That'll be enough to get him into top eight. Incredible good sportsmanship by Paul. Very nice to see how uh, Paul recognizes the situation, knows that 